Welcome to the Fox. Have we got a show for you? Have we got a show for you? And it is live. And it's live. And they are the Conway Brothers. Which one's Ross? 1985, the year in which Top of the Pops had never looked more professional. When you're watching it at home, it looked like this really sophisticated nightclub. Or felt more competitive. There wasn't that much camaraderie with other bands, like whispering and talking and pointing. The show now reflected the state of Thatcher's Britain, with a new breed of ambitious pop star. We were so confident. He knew it was going to happen. Rubbing shoulders with passionate political activists. Their job was to look like they were having a great time. And here I'm singing about, you know, war and death, strikes, <laughs> nuclear weapons. All soundtracked by the rise of sample-filled electronica. Now, why anybody would want you know, the sound of two dogs having intercourse baffled me. And topped off with a wind tunnel of big-haired power ballads. You could see all the fillings in your mouth and whatever. I'm like, I, I couldn't watch it half the time. I was like, oh, my, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. Imagine a vehicle that can drive you five miles for a penny. A vehicle that needs no petrol, just a battery. And that takes the press of a button to start, the squeeze of a lever to stop. Sinclair C5. It's a new power in personal transport. January 1985 saw the birth of an 80s icon in a brave new tech world. And in a parallel universe, Top of the Pops also ventured into pastures new. Now, on one, the people and songs that are everyone's talking point in Top of the Pops. The show was still run by Michael Hurl and regularly attracted 10 million viewers. But the first episode of the year had an announcement to make. Well, one or two changes in format on this week's Top of the Pops. Yep. Richard is now going to explain all. Well, it looks like this, you see. We went out to find out what you wanted from Top of the Pops and the overwhelming request was more top hits. So from this week, we count down the top ten, starting with Foreigner at number ten. <laughs> In days gone by, only seven or eight acts would feature on the show. This year, with short clips of videos from the top ten and beyond, there would be up to 19. This would soon benefit one band in particular. Dead or Alive had struggled in 84. Late in that year, they got new producers and a new lease of life. But their first single together proved a challenge. It was the most frustrating record in, in the history of Stock Aching Waterman. It would go up one week, go back the week after. Then it would go up and it would go down. After the whole of the rest of that year, it still hadn't really cracked the top 40. So Pete Waterman took it under his personal, his personal belt to make sure that it was a hit. CBS uh, said they wanted another mix. Now, I have to tell you at this point, We've done about five mixes. We're running out of ideas. And um, the BBC had a sound effects department and you could buy the sound effects records and covered everything. Every sound you could imagine was on these BBC archive sounds, you know, doors, you know, bridges, bombs, police sirens, everything. So I now I'm looking down at this and I noticed there was on one of this sound was two dogs having intercourse. Now, why anybody would want you know, the sound of two dogs having intercourse baffled me. We got carried away with it and we put it on the record. So it went out uh, just about the week before Christmas. So when we came back the first week in January, every club was playing this TDF mix. I mean, it was like the depot was full of orders. TDF, uh, you know, was not tour de force. It actually stood for two dogs. Through January 85, the TDF mix edged the song up the charts. And as fate would have it, in the last week of January, Top of the Pops introduced their new slot, featuring bands just breaking into the top 40. 
then suddenly 14 weeks in, it was number 40, and they decided to give us a break on Top of the Pops as a sort of a new entry. And this song has taken two and a half months to make the chart. In Liverpool, it's Pete Burns and Dead or Alive. You spin me round like a record. So when Michael Hurl called you and said, you know, we're going to put this record on as a break, we knew at that point that was the break we needed. No matter how many mixes we've done, the fact that Top of the Pops was going to show the video, we knew it was all over. Because we knew that once people saw Pete with his eye patch, with all the flags, we would be in the top 20 the next week. We knew. And that's the power that Top of the Pops had. We've got a new number one for you on this week's Top of the Pops, another live Top of the Pops, of course. Dead or Alive, another Merseyside fan. You want that moment where your dad goes, well, I've seen it all now. Don't you? You know, oh, well, that's, that's ridiculous. I'm sure there were houses throughout the UK going, what's that? The dog howls on Dead or Alive's infamous TDF mix were programmed with a keyboard sampler. Hey! This new tech was much loved by big producer acts like Trevor Horn's The Art of Noise. They performed tracks on top of the pops with minimum vocals and sampled sounds. Up till now, their favourite toy, the Fairlight Sampler, was, at 30 grand, the same price as a house. But in 85, at a quarter of the price, came the Emulator 2. And it inspired a young bedroom producer at his mum's house in Leytonstone. Around the start of 85, I was just at home and I was reading the paper and I saw that there was a programme on about Vietnam coming on, so I taped it. In World War II, the average age of the combat soldier was 26. In Vietnam, he was 19. And I found it very intriguing, the fact that the kids at the time that were going out to battle were only 19 years old, and yet in America, you can't even have a drink till you're 21. So I taped the program, and I was just mucking about with some rhythms and stuff like that, and I put some of the commentary in to the emulator, and one bit it just said, in Vietnam, he was 19. In Vietnam, he was 19. And I tapped it a few times, you know, on the keyboard, and then uh, it went, no, 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 no. I thought, wow, that's different. The Vietnam War has inspired an unusual pop record due to be released next week. All the indications are that it's going to be a big hit. In World War II, the average age of the combat soldier was 26. In Vietnam, he was 19. In, 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 in Vietnam, he was 19. Alongside the single, Paul asked the producers of Vietnam Requiem to create a video from the documentary's powerful footage. In Vietnam, the combat soldier typically served a 12-month tour of duty, but was exposed to hostile fire almost every day. It was so powerful. You're talking about young boys being sent off to foreign wars. You know, and it really, really had a resonance. According to a Veterans Administration study, half of the Vietnam combat veterans suffer from what psychiatrists call post-traumatic stress disorder. Many vets complain of alienation, rage, or guilt. Some succumb to suicidal thoughts. Eight to ten years after coming home, almost 800,000 men are still fighting the Vietnam War. I remember going into uh, Chrysalis and watching it, and I saw three women journalists actually come out crying. And that was, we thought, wow, what have we created here? It went in at number four in the charts, first weekend, which was incredible. A, a brand new act to go in at number four. At that time, it just did not happen. Michael Hurl, who was the uh, producer of the Top of the Pops at the time, basically kept on saying to me, you know, do you not think that you could really do something on Top of the Pops? I wasn't really sure what was going on. I think it would have been difficult for him to do that. How, how would have he performed the song? He'd probably end up like Harold Faltermeyer did, with the most boring live performance that I think that you'd ever see on Top of the Pops. 
Harold would not appear on top of the pops again and stalled at number two. But Paul's cut and paste technique in music and video proved an irresistible chart topping formula. He's a producer, he remixes records, and he's number one. Yes, for the second week running, Paul Hardcastle, 19. We got to number one and we were quite amazed by it all, but we want, obviously wanted to stay there. And um, Paul came up with several different mixes. And one of the reasons we did that was because um, Duran Duran were right behind us at number two. Okay, look yes. over your shoulder. I went back into the studio and I remixed the track and I changed some of the vocals around. Minute, 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 19. I added some new documentary which I'd found, which took the war on slightly further, and I called it the Destruction Mix. Unlike Vietnam, World War II saw America unite behind her fighting men. The two wars were just as different on the front lines as they were back home. So a different edit would go on to Top of the Pops each week. Which then people went out and repurchased. And we stopped, you know, the biggest band most probably in the world then, which were the Duranis. And also they had the biggest film in the world at the time with, with View to a Kill. And little old me stopped and being number one and it was quite a feat really. And I think Simon Le Bon wasn't too happy. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm two. Bon, Simon Le Bon. Now, Dire Straits have said that they won't be touring after the end of next year. It's simply too expensive, but they've got a great video. Money for nothing. This is it. 85 proved a turning point for the industry and for Top of the Pops. Videos were now more than half of the show. MTV hadn't arrived in Europe yet, but in America, exposure on the channel almost guaranteed success. mid-80s, what you were seeing was the record companies at their peak power. They knew how to market things. If you were launching a new washing powder, you'd do, you know, a big expensive ad, put it in lots of slots, and hopefully give it some sort of twist that got people talking about it. If you were launching a new band, you make a big expensive video, get it on MTV, and hopefully with some kind of innovative twist that got people talking about it. Now look at them yo-yos, that's the way you do it. Play the guitar on the MTV. That ain't working. That's the way you do it. Money for nothing and your tricks for free. And for three unknown musicians from Norway with a background in prog rock, video production would change their fortunes entirely. Well, we were just um, three very ambitious guys who moved away from our native Norway without uh, any other plan than to um, become pop stars. Coming to England, that was really the first time we sort of uh, got sort of bombarded with pop music because that wasn't really that much around in Norway. You know, we had like one hour a week on the radio where they play pop music. We took the ferry over the first time we came over and Human Lee was the first thing we heard in the cab. You know, builders would have blaring radios playing, you know, whistling along to pop songs that were uh, current, and it just felt really vibey and really different. And then hearing things like Soft Cell, Depeche Mode, all that electronic stuff that was going on was to us kind of like, whoa, this is kind of perfect for us. After a couple of years in the UK, AHA got a deal and started doing the rounds of kids' TV shows. But there was a problem. Nobody bought their debut single. Until Warner Brothers US, who'd signed AHA, proposed a hugely expensive hand-drawn video aimed at MTV. Now, three guys who come from Norway. It's reputed that £100,000 was spent on the video. It's worth every penny. A smash in America, now a smash in Britain. Take on me, AHA. The good thing is that we became very successful everywhere very fast. 
we could not compete with anything like that. We couldn't do it. I just, I just looked at it and thought, well, you know what? If that's the way the record industry is going, God help it. I thought, that's a game changer. They've made the video as important as the music. We actually sort of knew it was going to happen, if I can say that. Uh, we were so confident. It helped us, but it also propelled us into this lighter end of the music press. The bad thing is that you don't get to sculpt it your career. Everybody assumes they know everything about you based on that one song. And when those cheekbones finally appeared in person on Top of the Pops, their teen image was sealed. The fact that video led the way, it put our faces everywhere. And we didn't really expect that, so we, we felt kind of pushed into the smash hits. And, and we kind of just embraced it, but immediately thinking, whoa, this is super uncomfortable, what's going to happen now? We just tried to hold on for their life, and it's like riding a wild horse. I'm stuck there. I'm still stuck there. <laughs> Nineteen eighty-five saw the biggest pop groups of recent years grow older and start to take themselves very seriously. Half of the Durans indulged their artistic side with Arcadia. Spandau were in tax exile on a long world tour. Wham were in China, and Culture Club were falling apart. This left a sizable gap in the market. You always have every two or three years a new generation of pop fans turning around where they don't necessarily want the same heroes and heroines as their big brother or sister, they want their own. The record labels sensed an opportunity, as did one band from Coventry, whose big boots matched their ambitions and who appeared to know exactly what they were doing. Two years ago, when I first heard of King, a picture came through the post of a dolphin and Doc Martin boots. You were going to live that down. I think both those things simply were, we used the dolphin and the boots as a symbol of what King were about musically and spiritually. When we arrived to do that debut performance on Top of the Pops, I was wearing my uh, yellow check suit. We all had this big spiky hair going off all over the place. Almost like a Bay City Rollers kind of dress-up idea. I thought we could be that mixture of a credible, rock band who could appeal to a teen pop audience. Unfortunately for us, our left label looked at the check suits and the Dr. Martin boots and saw a novelty band. So they could say, okay, hit single band, great. Maybe one year, two years of life. 85, King were everywhere. I don't think there was one pop show that King did not appear on. Throughout 85, I think we were on top of the pops seven times. In the era that we broke through with things like smash hits and videos and top of the pops, you're going to be picked up by teenagers. In the end, for us, unfortunately, that became the predominant audience that our record label wanted to direct their focus for us towards. <laughs> Automatically, now, the credible music audience, the gatekeepers, are looking at that and thinking, well, they're not a credible music band. King weren't really part of my world. They weren't part of like the club scene. They didn't feel that cool. And they were like this kind of weird, almost Frankenstein's monster with styled up bits of lots of other bands stuck together with a kind of Rod Stewart mullet and some DMs on top. A 
eventually, we, we started bickering between ourselves as a unit. That by the time we got to Christmas, Top of the Pops and stuff, we, we were pretty much over as a band anyway. But then, of course, we went on to do the Old Grey Whistle Test New Year's Eve. Look okay, either new, it's King! Yay! And we were playing that show, and my manager and I had a serious conversation uh, of saying, OK, yeah, we've got one great moment here. Why don't we go out and do our David Bowie, Hammersmith moment? And we seriously talked about it, which was to walk out on stage and say, thanks, everybody, it's been a great year, but King are never going to play together again. And I kind of wish we'd done that now. But in 85, it wasn't just the teenage top of the pops market that record companies had their eye on. I've got to take a little time A little time to think things over I think the rise of the power ballad was very much the record companies reasserting their control. It was a way of appealing back to the mainstream who'd been alienated by pop at the start of the 80s by these weird girls dressed as boys and boys dressed as girls and men wearing tablecloths across one shoulder. You had a good, honest person singing into a wind machine with a tune you could recognise. Power ballad has to be very big hair, very serious expression. Soaring vocals, Strings. In a way, it was kind of the housewife revenge. I wanna know what love is. Chism pads and drama. Who's gonna drive you home tonight? It was big drum sounds. Snare drums going on for nine, nine seconds per hit. Lots of emotion and a little bit of cheese. The Power of Love was the biggest selling record of 85, in a year that record labels found multiple ways to target the mainstream. The interesting thing about 85, I think, is the explosion of songs coming from movies. Madonna had Into the Groove from Desperately Seeking Susan. Harold Faltermeyer's Axe Left was from Beverly Hills Cop. Duran Duran's View to a Kill. Tina Turner's We Don't Need Another Hero from Mad Max. You've got a situation with a lot of the big corporations that were actually had a film arm. The synergy of record companies and film companies often being owned by the same people and they're suddenly realising, hey, we could maximise our exposure to uh, this song if we have it on our soundtrack. Get her. In 85, power ballads found a natural home on movie soundtracks. And this tradition was arguably started by a ballad from a British star, first released in 84. Well, Holding Out for a Hero was written for the film Footloose. And it was in a very exciting part of the film, so um, it had to be high energy, you know. They took me to film studios to play the rushes of the part where Kevin Bacon was doing the chicken run in the film, you know, where his foot gets stuck on the accelerator and, and he wins. The record was initially a flop until it was championed by the same clubbing audience who adopted You Spin Me Round. And in 85, the song made a dramatic re-entry into the charts. And still at number two, a great lady who had no idea that the single had been released until it charted. Holding out for a hero, aren't we all? It's Bonnie Tyler. When I was asked to go on Top of the Pops, I'll never forget where I was because I was living in New York at the time in a suite in the Parker Meridian. And there was a swimming pool on the top floor and I get a phone call to say, come back to London to do Top of the Pops. And I said, yeah. know that had been a big hit in the gay bars a lot of the gay bars and uh, you know clubs and things were playing it 
became huge. Majestic, you know, and with Jim Steinman, everything's in there but the kitchen sink, you know. All those bongos or whatever you call them. And the backing vocals. They build and they build and they build to a oh, crescendo, you know. Oh, but the dreadful outfits of the 80s. Oh, my God. My father used to warn me, he said, you look like an American baseball player with them shoulder pads. In the 80s, we all looked stupid like that. And they always have these cameras underneath your chin. Looking up your nose. You know, you could see all the fillings in your mouth. I couldn't watch it half the time. I was like, oh my, oh no, oh no, oh no. I love the song and I love performing it live as well. Strong and it's gotta be fast, gotta be fresh from the fight. I need a hero. <laughs> Talking of heroes, July '85 saw a charity concert on a different scale. To me, it is not a pop concert, to me, it's not a TV show, to me, it's simply a means of keeping people alive. It got royal approval as the new pop elite joined forces with Rock's older statesmen. The feeling about the concert is so exciting. I think it's going to be marvellous. I think it will be on my mind just how many people are watching while I'm singing. All right! We were going to be the first band on until quite late in the day when they managed to get the Mighty Quo, which was a, the perfect starter. I remember seeing you two on it, you know, and thinking, oh my goodness, how fantastic is that? did wonders for a lot of bands, even the bands that had slightly, maybe slightly peaked, it rejuvenated them, I think. Well, look, if you want to hold your piece, come on, hold it somewhere else. Somebody has to do something about this, come on. I don't want to hurt you. But famine in Africa wasn't the only issue on people's minds in 85. There were demonstrations against nuclear weapons, and the miners' strike reached a tipping point. European trip. And in his manager's old again. Volvo estate, young anti pop star Billy Bragg toured the country on a one man mission. Rock and roll is on the road again. strike had been going on since the spring of 1984. A lot of people were involved in supporting different pits. Billy herself come and did a gig down in Cork before us and raised us X amount of money. And uh, in return, I should like to have the pleasure of presenting him with this lamp. Early on in the minor strike, I went and did a gig up in the northeast uh, in a mining town and the support act was a guy named Jock Purden 
who was a, a guy in his, might have been in his 70s, an ex minor. And he sat on stage, didn't have any instruments, sang a cappella with his, his hand over his ear. So I wanted to write a song that expressed clearly that I was part of that tradition now. And Between the Wars was that song. I played the union, and as times got harder, I looked to the government to help the working man. But they brought prosperity down at the armory where I'm in for peace, me boys, between the wars. I was trying to make a point, not just about the minor strike, but also about the possibility of nuclear war. Because the idea of nuclear annihilation was very real to us at the time. I mean, the government were producing pamphlets to tell you, you know, to hide under your living room table and uh, keep your tail between your legs. And it's a chart entry at number 40 for the alarm, an absolute reality. And the thoughts of Chairman Billy surprisingly catapulted him into the charts. Down at 38, Mick Jagger, just another night. The great thing about Top of the Pops is while most of it was kind of mainstream light entertainment, there was always room for outsiders. A new entry at 33, Billy Bragg and the Between the Wars EP. And Top of the Pops, because it was so simple, it was just me and the guitar anyway, I wanted to play live. And this caused no end of problems. Well, now, it took me three listens before I really understood this song. This really is an evocative song. Live in the studio, would you welcome Billy Bragg and Between the Wars. I can remember Steve Wright asking, what's the song about? So I gave him a whole explanation about, you know, nuclear war and the, the strike and everything. Oh. I was a miner, I was a docker, I was a railwayman between the wars. I raised a family in time of austerity with sweat at the foundry between the wars. The thing about the audience for Top of the Pops was that their job was to look like they were having a great time. And here I'm singing about, you know, war and death strikes <laughs> nuclear weapons but they brought prosperity down at the armory we're arming for peace me boys between the wars i remember the director going over to the audience at the tip of the stage where i was performing and giving them directions to to kind of dance to the song and then like nodding everything, and him walking off, and then I walked over to the tip of the stage and said, look, I'm really playing this live, okay? I'm not miming. So do what you gotta do, but bear in mind, I'm actually playing live, so please don't do anything that distracts me. This is a land of hope and glory. Mine is the greenfield and the factory floor. There's all the skies all dark with I felt I got a lot of support from that audience. They realised it was something different here. It wasn't just run of the mill, some bloke miming a song and, you know, it didn't really matter. They recognised I was actually performing. While Billy's song climbed the charts, the impoverished miners resorted to desperate measures and the strike came to a sad and bitter end. And we were told You'll never stand a major industrial strike, let alone a coal strike. Mr. President, it lasted a whole year, but we did just that and won. The strike might have been over, but elsewhere, political passions were still running high. With anger at American cruise missiles being stored at an airbase in Berkshire, and some of Top of the Pops' most famous faces found themselves right in the middle of it. When we went up to Greenham Common, we went up to meet the ladies, and it was a really, really early start, and we were gonna take some wood and food parcels up to the, to the girls at Greenham Common. And in the background, you could see these bombers, you know, these massive American B-52s, I think they were, all covered in mist. It was very, very eerie. We went up to the fence and there was a soldier there and he kind of looked at us and he said, oh, you know, I really like the Star Council and I didn't expect to see you sort of guys here. You know, what are you doing supporting these women? And 
I just sort of said to him about, you know, do you, do you not really listen to what the lyrics about the, the, the band have actually been singing about and the, what Paul's written about with these lyrics? And he, he clearly just didn't understand it. And as we kind of begged to differ and walked away, he just sort of gobbed at us through the fence. With their next single, the Style Council clearly nailed their political colours to the mast, taking aim at Thatcher's government and targets closer to home at Top of the Pops. I remember Paul saying, you've got to put a strong message out that there is something better out there. And, and the, you know, the whole thing about you, you can't sit back and relax when Frankie goes to Hollywood, we're telling everyone to, to relax. Because Paul was very aware of the other artists around us. He had a lot of opinions about the artists around us. Well, it was sticking to his guns, and, and if he wanted to, to blast pop aristocracy, as I think they were now calling themselves, he would do it. When we were at Top of the Pops, there wasn't that much camaraderie with other bands. A bit of meanness in the canteen, like whispering and talking and pointing. Very, very schoolyard. For us at that time, it meant that, you know, we must be making a bit of a mark. I think it was a bit of a call to arms at that time and it you know it firmly stamped what the whole band were thinking you know we all we all had different issues and agendas but we were all broadly very very left wing and it was the sort of record for me that really encapsulated what the band was about Are you gonna be but when it came to the video the band's decision to get real and take pop to the comrades in Poland took them on an enlightening journey. But this is our video for our new single called Walls Come Tumbling Down. You know, I knew kind of Poland was behind the Iron Curtain and that was where the alarm bell started to ring for me. But we went. It rained for four days. Mick managed to bump into somebody and they dropped their baby on a tram. I drank probably more vodka than I'd ever had in my life. We hardly ate. It was a very drab place, Warsaw, in 1985. The people were very, very downtrodden. That You could see the evidence of alcoholism. It was just a grim place. We were recording it at this club called The Aquarium, and they kind of shipped him some students that were allowed to come and watch us, probably all state approved. And then there's one guy in the video who's slightly better dressed than everybody else, and he was hanging around, and I think he was a spy. <laughs> When the Eurythmics let the cameras into their studios in 85, the power duo were at the top of their game. Dave had a smash album with four hit singles, and they, alongside other British power duos, proved that by working as a tight, self-contained unit in control of your sound and image, new breed of duo, including Tears for Fears and Godly and Cream, could move from indie to mainstream international success without losing their cred. Back at Television Centre, Top of the Pops tried to find their own dynamic duos by continuing to pair presenters. And in 85, when Kid Jensen, one of the show's favourite faces, left the BBC, 
his long-term sidekick, John Peel, found a new friend. Hello, welcome to a live Top of the Pops. I'm Auntie Janice. And I'm Uncle John, and we're going to play you some songs from the hit parade, aren't we, Janice? They're smashing like the Star Council, and walls come tumbling down. We were mates, and um, both loved music, both from the same neck of the woods. And we just hit it off uh, straight away. And when David Jensen left Radio 1 to go to Capital, uh, Peely would only do Top of the Pops with me to, to Michael Hull. I'm not going to do it unless I can do it with Janice. And we used to have such a laugh. Great pair of trousers. I'm really into men's trousers. Well, the less said about that, the better, if you ask me. We'd, we'd be chatting and then we'd think, oh, should we say that? And he'd go, you can't say that because you might get in trouble, but I can say that. And then I go, all right, well, and I'll do that. How do you know that I had him on my bedroom wall? That seems to indicate a degree of agility I didn't believe you're capable of, Janice, I must say. We used to have great, great fun, giggling and being told off sometimes for some of the things we said. Not by the producers, but by <laughs> complaints from the public. Wasn't it there was Elaine Page, Barbara Dixon and Jennifer Rush on the same show. Um, we said, coming up tonight on the show. Page, Rush, Dixon. And Peely said... It sounds like a sordid incident in a cheap motel. And I said... <laughs> I wouldn't know about that. That's not what I hear, Janice. <laughs> These are the more recent number ones from 1985. It was a natural, natural banter that we had. Uh, let's have a look at the top 40 selling singles in the country this week. And guess where we start, eh? And we did, we just laughed all at the time. Chart entry at 38, Falling Angels Riding, David Essex. And another chart entry at 37, Loose Ends Hanging on a String. Ah, but this one's going down to 36, This House, Big Sound Authority. At 35, Ross Abbott with Joy Division's Atmosphere. It was like that even when we went to Radio 1 to work, because I was on before him, and all we'd do was giggle. I remember him telling me once, and I can't remember whether this was at Top of the Pops or we were in Radio 1, but he said that he would like to actually get rid of everybody at Radio 1, apart from me. He said, I could stay. And Bruno Brooks, but he put him on reception. <laughs> we're going to play out, dearly beloved, with Amy Stewart. Can I just say happy birthday to Peely? Good night. Bye. Good night. This year also saw change in the presenter roster, with the arrival of the first black DJ on Top of the Pops since the 1970s. Bernie Michael cut his teeth at Radio Caroline, where he acquired the DJ name Dixie Peach. In 84, he was poached by Radio One, but curiously not to play the soul music he'd spun on pirate radio. Dixie Peach was a lovely human being, Dixie Peach was, and he really loved his soul. Absolutely loved soul music, but for some reason it seemed to be doing a rock show. When I was at Radio One, I was one of the few uh, black presenters on, on the station. The fact that I was actually doing a rock show, I presume, made me more versatile. In the summer of 85, this slightly wary newcomer was invited to present Top of the Pops. No, there were very few black faces around at the time. Anything you did would really stand out as far as, um, what's he saying, what's he doing, you know, what's happening there? Thank you for being with us tonight on Top of the Pops. Next week it's presented by Britain's answer to Crockett and Tubbs. That's Gary Davis and Dixie Beach. The first show was terrifying. I got to the studios and uh, I was amazed by the people at the gates as you're going into the building screaming. And I got recognised, which was really strange. I think that was the very first time anyone shouted at me, uh, Dixie! <laughs> Went into the uh, studios, everything was incredibly quick. You're doing this, you're doing that, blah, 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 you've got so much time. Uh, are you ready? Here we go. Welcome to Britain's best love serial, Top of the Soaps. You've seen him on Radio 1 for the first ever time on television. A natural, life-size effigy of Dixie Beach. Thanks, Mike. I've been laying in the sun in anticipation for this big event. But tonight, I'm going to kick off with Screedy Polini, Worker. I, I, I'm, I'm still stunned the whole time I'm doing it. Well, from a bit of down, down to a bit of up, up. I probably had a bit of paper down down there and I, I would have had what bands are coming up next 
on it. Here are the top 40 breakers. I bent down before we had actually finished doing the piece. So that just goes to show that my timing and everything, I need to get that together. It took me a little while. Madonna, great stuff by Madonna there. Now to the sound at number 30. It's Virgil Sharkey with Loving You. The links were mainly a natural thing. We would get to the studio, we would have no idea who was performing that particular show. Uh, we had no idea what we were doing. Hello, operator. Can you, can you connect me to Flash Gordon, please? Oh, hi, it's Flash speaking here. Flash. <laughs> well, you have to rush. So you'd finish going, you know, going, da 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 da, here's the Smiths with How Soon Is Now. The Smiths, How Soon Is Now. <laughs> and as soon as they started, you'd have to leg it across the studio and uh, climb up these steps and get onto the gantry. And then somebody would rearrange the crowd. We were never told what to say, ever. Um, it was entirely up to you. Oh, when we do the first link, let's do this. And I thought, OK, all right. Hey, how are you doing? Welcome to Top of the Box. We've got a knockout show lined up for you. And here is the only man who at Radio 1 has got a better suntan than me. It's funny looking back on it now, thinking, hmm, <laughs> maybe not. It's Radio 1. Me having a tan was always a running gag on Radio 1, so I guess when uh, Dixie and I presented the show for the first time, it was uh, just something we did in, in all innocence. I think it was a bit of a, a thing that um, I thought could break the ice, you know, at the time. Not the way I'd do it now. If it was hard making it as a black DJ, for loose ends, making it as a black British soul act, after three years, six singles and no hits, was nigh on impossible. We were talking of a time, by the way, when nobody believed that British black acts could have hits. It wasn't that, oh, fantastic, somebody is at last making some great British black records. No, the opposite. How dare you? This is American market. In the face of that prejudice, but inspired by the new electro soul of American hitmakers like Cameo, Loose Ends went in search of a stateside sound. So we went to America, and the first thing, I'm a bass player, and the first thing the guy does is like, well, we're not going to put no bass on this record. We're going to put Moog bass, keyboard bass. <laughs> And they were fooling around with 808 drum machines. We uh, added it, and instantly it was like the song just sort of stood up. You know, it had this little bell thing. The single went top 20 and Loose Ends finally got the long-awaited summons from TV Centre. Cars were sent at 7 o'clock in the morning. It was almost like going to the Buckingham Palace. The guy came outside my house and stood up with his hat in his, in his, in his, <laughs> on his chest. So he's standing there. So I looked out the window and oh, the kids from the flats were all looking at, who's this geezer standing outside? So we get to the top of the pops, the guy opens the door and we get out. You are getting very nervous when you're in the BBC dressing room because everyone around is so prim and proper. Everyone is like, eh. you know, the ladies are coming with the um, clipboard and the pencil in the ear and the walkie-talkies. It's a very strange experience because people are cheering and the song's just starting up and it's quiet. It's not loud, it's very quiet. And these people go, Ey! When I saw it back, I just thought, wow, it didn't feel like that. They made it look so different. Other people are seeing it, they don't get that. They just get the performance. <laughs> Friends were looking at it and going, gosh, Carl, I can't believe it was you. That's not you, is it? Is that you? Pop 
music was very white at the time. But what you're starting to see is groups like Loose Ends, which were the start of the being a proper British soul music. <laughs> still heavily influenced by America, but it was mixed with that very English jazz funk feel as well. But in spite of their newfound success, Loose Ends knew there was a danger of them losing their valuable home crowd that had grown them in the first place. Once you were now making mainstream music, could lose your core audience. It was almost a prerequisite of success for British soul music. We had these people that worked with us that showed us that today you do Top of the Pops, let's go down to Harlston, like a little reggae club in Harlston, and let's do a PA for these people because they don't know you're coming and you just now was on TV. So if you turn up, it's going to be like, wow. Leading up to Christmas, competition for the coveted number one slot was festively fierce. And a perfect recap of the year. Well, hey, how you doing? Welcome to Top of the Box. Do you realise only 10 days to go to stuff your Christmas turkey? 10 days to buy all your Christmas records. Tonight, some of the records you've already bought. He is so Among the contenders, there was a song from a movie. Say you. Even if we don't all remember White Nights with Barishnikov and Helen Mirren. That's the way to be. Will you ever learn to love? The Style Council's DC Lee had a soul power ballad in the top three. Good love will always come from me. In the wake of Live Aid, there was an update of last year's number one. It's Christmas time There's no need to be afraid Wham! re-released the biggest number two of all time Last Christmas I gave you my heart But the very next day You gave it away gave it. And a young Alec Jones soared into the charts Through the dry ice, it looked like no one else had a snowball's chance in hell of getting to number one. But never underestimate the hit machine who'd been waiting in the wings for a whole year. Right now on Top of the Box, a very big hit. The biggest climber on the chart this week. Up 28 places to number 10. Merry Christmas, everyone. Here's Shaking Stevens. At that particular time uh, of the 80s, I mean, everybody and their dad was putting out Christmas tracks. Snow is falling all around me. Children play. In 84, a Merry Christmas, everyone, was sent down from the writer, Bob Heatley, and I first heard it and I thought, wow, this is uh, a number one record. Merry Christmas, everyone. And we held it back till 85 because there's no way you can compete with Band-Aid, you know, with a charity record. The video, I think it was done in Sweden, uh, I believe, in Lapland. I didn't know what to wear. I had these jumpers. I, I don't know where they came from. And uh, I thought, I'll put this on, you know. I still get a bit of uh, poke about my jumpers. Shaky. I mean, a real British institution. Everybody loved Shaky. I think people like Shaky and Stevens, they do what they say on the tin. You know, they're not kind of asking you to listen to their prog album. They just do what they do, and, and people are very comforted by that. I don't think there was anybody around like me at that particular time, you know, dancing, uh, throwing myself around like I did. I guess I just suited uh, Top of the Pops. It's 
smashed it, didn't they? Went straight in and uh, beat everybody and wham and band-aid. They couldn't get a look in. It was, it was shaky's year, wasn't it? But hiding in those Christmas charts was the shape of things to come for 86. With the soon-to-be number one debut of the inspirational, poetic and very English Pet Shop Boys. Not that in 86 anybody could stop the imperial tide of big haired metal. Big haired punks with the biggest recording advance in history. And big haired soap stars. As the song rightly says. Whoa! 